Welcome, welcome to the Rick Helps Real Estate Show. We try to make sense of today's Arizona real estate market. And finally, after doing this for almost two years, numbers are changing. <laughs> it was getting pretty boring there for a while, wasn't it? Get on and I go, oh, we had 4,800 homes come on the market and 4,700 go under contract. Those numbers have changed quite a bit. And so has the sentiment. And I'm going to take a peek at some numbers that I think we need to watch closely. Doesn't mean we're crashing and you need to hurry, but it means things are slowing. And there's lots of evidence of that. And there's a lot of things to look at that people blatantly ignored back in what I called the silly season of 2006. I'm going to touch a little bit on that as well. But let's talk about where people are right now. Home builder comments in April. Demand is slowing. Investors are pulling back. You can see here that Dallas builders interest lists are shrinking and buyers are truly pausing. Houston says same thing. Many time first buyers are simply no longer, they no longer qualify with the increase in interest rates as their debt to income ratio gets out of whack. Provo investors are evaluating the investments more critically than in the past. Seattle builder paused by a large population of buyers to achieve our desired sales pace. We had to make price adjustments. Hmm, we're starting to see that. Doesn't mean their base price has gone down. Their rate of increase is still up, but their expectations have to be brought in line. Rates are starting to knock people out of qualifications. This one says in Riverside, San Bernardino, cancellations are starting to creep up due to loan declines and job losses. Now, I haven't seen any data about the job losses. If you're out in that area, let me know. I haven't heard that. I haven't heard of job losses anywhere. I've heard of labor shortages. Waiting lists are certainly smaller. Saw an immediate change in buyer behavior when rates climbed over 5%. That seemed to be the magic number right there. And uh, and we're seeing it, and we're feeling it here in Arizona, but we're not, you know, we're still seeing some bidding wars going on because there's just no inventory. There's no homes for sale. So, I mean, just past seven days, we had 4,893 homes come on the market, which is a huge number in comparison to where we have been. But we still put over almost 3,600 of them under, under contract. So, yeah, it's, that's a little more than half, isn't it? About 70, 75%. So that's why price increases are still out there. But how long will they be here? This is days of inventory. And it says excluding under contract, accepting backups and contingencies. So kind of a true clean number. And we're almost at 25 days. Now... They go on here to say, while the numbers are low in absolute terms, the 2022 line is shooting skywards like a missile. This tells us supply is increasing very quickly relative to demand. And we're, we're seeing that more and more. At 24 days, inventory remains very low at the moment. But we have seen in the past, specifically in 2005, and I'm going to show that to you, that 24 in April can grow to 82 by year end and over 200 the following summer. And I am not saying this is going to happen in 2022 or 2023, says Michael Orr. But I am saying this trend needs to be watched very closely. A balanced market will have about 120 to 130 days of 135 days of inventory. And if we get more than 150 days, we'll be in a buyer's market. No one, um, one where prices will tend to fall rather than rise. My advice is to keep watching days of inventory like a hawk and react appropriately. Now, primarily, he's, he's advising um, speculators. In 2006, and I'll show you some numbers here and tell you what, what happened back then and why people weren't paying attention. But he referenced 2005 here, so let's go there. We're down here at 25. And you can see that this green line here is, is 2005, and we look like we're right on path to do what happened in 2005. And by November... We had 80 days of supply. You know, if no other homes come on the market at the current rate of home purchases, it'll take 80 days to get rid of all those houses. That's what that means. But then in 2006, look at this, it went crazy. Now, 2006, let's take a look at here in July. Had 189 days supply on the market. What do prices do when you have 189 days of supply? Well, let's go back and see what he said here earlier in the comments. And he goes, um, a balanced market 
is anything between 120 to 135, 150 days will be a buyer's market. Really? Then tell me why in July of 2006, with our supplies being 189 days of supply, that prices were still going up. Now you understand the problem with the market, and here's what it was. You can see that in 2005, August, we went up 45.2%. Let's go to July. Roll it over here. Take a look. December, January, February, March, April, May, June, July. Still up 5.8%. Wait. I thought it was a buyer's market. It wasn't because what happened was during that time period, different than today, everybody thought if they don't get a home now, they're never going to get one. So they were scooping them up as soon as they came on. You put your house up, boom, everybody came in, they bought the house. I don't recall a lot of bidding wars, but I recall homes just not staying on the market. And there weren't bidding wars because the inventory was so huge. You didn't have to bid. You know, if they come into this house and somebody had already bought it, we just moved on to the next one. And we could get a loan by going in and saying, my name's Rick, I make $70,000 a year. Here's the approval from a cocktail napkin uh, from my lender. I mean, I was actually standing next to a lender back in uh, 2012, I think it was. And he goes, I'll, I'll go ahead and pre-approve them now. I'll look at the numbers in the morning. And that's why the Dodd-Frank Act came in and changed all that nonsense, the CFPB. So back then, it was really easy to get a loan. And the loans were cheap. They were interest only or only 1%. And don't worry if they reset in two years. Who cares? I'm going to have so much equity. I can get rid of that house. I mean, my neighbor... She bought that house last month. She's already got $45,000 in equity. Imagine where I'm going to be in a year. Those were real conversations in 2006. People got burned badly, and people remember it. That's why now everybody goes, crash is coming. Here we go again. Well, maybe, maybe not. And if we take a look at this and take a look at the, uh, I got to go back where I was. Right now, we're at 23.9% year over year. We were rocking in May of 39.2% year-over-year appreciation, and it's coming down. But maybe, perhaps, it'll come down and just muddle down where it was. You know, going up 1.1% or 2% a month, not a bad thing. It's not a crash. Even if we go down 1% or 2%, what's the second dip right here? Well, we crashed. Lehman Brothers collapsed right about here. Everything just went crazy. All the banks went out of business. Countrywide, remember them? Nobody knew where the loans went. We had some activity that's spit up a little bit there but then here came the wave of foreclosures so between here and here the banks had to find out who owned the loans and then they started dumping them here investors jump in picked them up over there so what am what's the point that i'm making the point is in 2006 nobody paid attention to the numbers and everybody that looked at the numbers was shouting from the rooftop telling people to be careful but people were saying, but my neighbor, but my friend, but my dad. And they weren't paying attention to the actual dynamics of simple supply and demand. There was plenty of supply out there. And there were more people, there, there were people buying houses. Or let me put it this way, there were more homes being built than were moving here. You could see all these construction trucks and all these developments coming here. And then you look at the moving data and you go, I don't get it. There aren't, who, who are they building these homes for? Well, people were buying them because they could, so they bought more than one. And so we just went nuts. Now, our population growth is off the charts, and they aren't able to build enough. That could change. We're seeing the builder sentiment. Things are slowing down. I also see people waiting in the sidelines saying, well, I'm going to wait. And as soon as I see an opportunity, I'm going to get in. If rates go down, I'm, I'm getting in. I don't see anybody saying, I'm out. I hear a lot of people saying, I'm going to wait for the crash. That's, that's out there. I hear a lot of that. Do I think a crash is coming? I haven't seen the numbers yet to tell me one is coming. I am seeing numbers, and I've been saying this for a long time, that if I see numbers of things changing, I'm going to share them with you because the only reason you know whether this number is good or bad is because you've been following the channel for a while, and you can tell. You know that we have over 7,000 listings on the market, that that's considerably higher than what we've had most of the year. But we also know that's not a huge number. And we know that 25 days of supply, that's not an alarming number. So we watch the trend. And if it starts going up, that may be the canary in the coal mine. 
So if you're thinking about selling, it might make your decision on when to sell a little bit more clear. Nobody's going to know when we're exactly at the top. You hear us say a lot, nobody rings a bell at the top, nobody rings a bell at the bottom. But there are indicators that say, well, it looks like next year doesn't look like it's going to be good as this year. And that's, you know, that's close enough. It's like horseshoes. All you got to do is be close. You don't have to have a ringer every time. So if you're thinking of selling, it's time to start maybe looking at what the value of your home is currently. And I don't mean by going to Zillow, Realtor.com, and Redfin, because you've got three different answers. But have a professional look at it and sit down and discuss it with you. Look at all the comps. Have a real frank conversation. Please, please don't rely on just one person coming in and saying, give me 15 minutes and I'll give you the number. Don't let anybody give you a number. Have an agent come in and explain how they arrived at that number so that you can feel good about it. Because the asking price is ultimately your decision. You're the one that's going to determine the price. You just need the data. You need access to the data that you can't get. You can't get access like I can get. And anybody that's in the MLS, we can look at all kinds of stuff. And we, we pay for data. So we get to look and see where the market is headed. But mostly we just look behind us like no more than three months ago. Well, here's how pricing shook out in your neighborhood, in this house style, square foot, and in this condition. And this is the range of which your house sits. So where would you like to be in here, Mr. and Mrs. Jones? You know, do you want to be at the very high end of that range and see what happens? And be careful because time on market can hurt your sale. Or do you want to be somewhere in the middle? And then where you end up in that range depends on if prices are starting to come up, if they're starting to slow. If prices are starting to level off, you don't want to be on the far end of the pricing. You want to be at market or slightly below market in, in order to find a buyer. So my point is make sure it's a conversation, not a mouse click. Because you want to price your house correctly in a market like this. And you want to make the right decisions. I hope that helps. Do me a favor before you leave. Smash that like button. Thank you.